looking at the city kids as they are leaving uh, the service to go to the city kids ministry this morning, I'm reminded that, that <clears throat> children are, are, are really just spectacular in that, like adults, when it's cold outside, they will put on a jacket and earmuffs, but unlike adults, they will wear it through the entirety of church. They'll leave the earmuffs on and all. There, there was a couple of kids down here who looked like they were bundled, bundled up for a blizzard. I'm like, it's pretty warm in here. I don't, doesn't matter. Came to church and it's what I'm going to wear. Good morning. Open your Bibles to Mark 3. Mark 3. We finished the third chapter today. Unbelievable. It's, uh, it's not unbelievable. It's taken us 12 weeks. We're, we're really on a, a great pace, I think. Uh, while you're turning there, growing up, I uh, want to share with you that don't know me well, I did not have the best childhood. I I came out of a a pretty broken home, fairly volatile situation. Some seasons of my life were were smooth, but there were some really, there were some really dark ones as well. A lot of um, alcohol and drug abuse, a lot of brokenness. And so as a kid, I dealt with a lot of big feelings, feelings that I didn't necessarily know how to express, or at least in a healthy manner. And, And I found comfort then, as many kids my age, especially during that time, did, in music, and in particular with heavier music. Uh, Being a young person with a lot of anger, I didn't really know how to work through that, how to express it right, didn't have anyone helping me with it. I didn't grow up in the church. And and so the heavier music helped put into words a lot of what I was feeling at the time. It helped articulate a lot of what was going on inside of me. And, And this is not just true for me, but as I said, many friends in my circles growing up were in this sort of same uh, category. There, there was a lot of camaraderie in these circles as a result of that. It, we we, we um, had so many shared experiences that were difficult, that were hard. And so a lot of my friends felt like, like more significant than friends. They were like family. I mean, it was like sort of a new family that was being formed, a, a family of misfits, a, a family of sad and angry, lonely kids that were just trying to figure out things in uh, our lives. In fact, this sensation of family uh, in this community, this particular community, became so widespread, such a sensation that, uh, especially in the late 90s and early 2000s, some of the bands that we listened to put together a tour called the Family Values Tour. <laughs> to capitalize on this, that's my wife. Um, <laughs> she knows. This actually is a not ticket of my own. This was November 3rd. November 6th was actually the, uh, the, the show that I went to. It was in Dallas, not in Tampa. Um, in 2001, that was the same year, by the way, that the American Airlines Center opened, but it was not at the American Airlines Center. This tour went through Dallas and the legendary Reunion Arena. Those of you who know, know. But the name of the tour, I think, highlights what so many young people at that time felt, a sense of belonging, a sense of meaningful community, a sense of family, that were bonded together with shared experiences of difficulty and hardship. And I think this highlights something very true within the Christian context that many of you no doubt relate to today as well. And that is this, the boundaries of your family often extend beyond the nuclear family unit. Let me say that again. The boundaries of your family often extend beyond the boundaries of the nuclear family unit. In other words, who you consider family is not necessarily confined to biology, right? There are people in your life, in other words, that are sometimes closer to you than your biological family is. You would put them above even your biological family. They are more important or more of a priority to you than the biological family that you have been given. And this is not only acceptable, I don't think, as as Christians, but it's actually the normative experience of Christians. And don't take my word for it. Take Jesus' word for it. In Mark 3 today, verses 31 through 35... What we find is that Jesus has a different way of defining the family. Or perhaps a better way of thinking about it is this, that Jesus is creating a new kind of family within himself. Now to be clear, I'm going to be very clear up front, we're going to talk about this more later, this does not mean that the nuclear family doesn't matter. The Bible has a lot of things to say about the value of the nuclear family. We will talk about that in depth near the end of the message. The importance of honoring your father and mother. The importance of raising your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. These things matter a great deal. But in this passage, in Mark 3, there's also a new family being born or a new family being created. One that's formed around the shared conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
And this new family, in many ways, takes precedent over the nuclear family. Not all of your nuclear family will agree or confess Jesus is Lord. Some of you have the experience that none of your nuclear family will agree or confess that Jesus is Lord. <clears throat> Jesus sometimes, and this may shock you, but I'm just here to report the truth. Sometimes Jesus divides the nuclear family. So check this one out for those of you who love a good coffee cup verse. Matthew 10, 34 and 35. Do not think, Jesus says, that I have come to bring peace to the earth. Thought you were the prince of peace. No, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. We saw that one coming. Let's just be honest about that. Sometimes Jesus brings a sword to the nuclear family. Not because he hates the family, but because in him, he's creating a new family that agrees and confesses that he is Lord of all. Now, that is, I think, the big idea of the text this morning, or one of the big takeaways of this morning. But, but as always, we want to understand the context of the passage that we're going to be reading. So let's set the stage. This is a continuation of three weeks now worth of readings. If you go all the way back to the passage that we looked at in the first Sunday of this month, January 7th, right after the Advent series when we started back up in Mark's Gospel, everything we've read beginning that morning goes together. It's telling the same story, or the, it's all the same story, but the same exact, like, individual story. So let's recap a little bit so that we're up to speed. Some of you uh, haven't been here for all of those weeks. That's okay. No judgment, but do listen online. Um, verses 13 through 19, two weeks ago, Jesus, if you remember, called the original 12 as his apostles. We talked about that, the calling of God. And how apostles today are not a thing, but God calls us to other things. And so that's an important thing for us to think through. Verse 20, it says, Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. Which, if I'm just being honest, for me, who loves food, this is one of the most annoying verses in the Bible. Let the people eat, right? They couldn't even eat because of how crowded it was. This is likely the home of Simon and Andrew in the city of Capernaum. And, and there were so many people there, they couldn't even move around to get food to the table. Verse 21 tells us that the nuclear family of Jesus had heard about everything that was going on in Jesus' ministry, and they decided to travel there themselves and take Jesus back with them because they thought he's gone crazy. Now, while they're on their way to this house in Capernaum, the scribes from Jerusalem arrive. They are there on behalf of the Sanhedrin. We talked about this last week. They're there to determine whether or not Jesus is a false teacher and whether Capernaum has been seduced by his teachings. They accuse him, if you remember, of, of working miracles according to demonic power. And so Jesus rebukes them. He talks about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That was last week. If you missed it, go back and listen. As this is ending, the nuclear family of Jesus arrives. And they can't get to him to talk with him because, remember, it's very crowded where he is. There are a lot of people surrounding him. That is where our text picks up. This is verses 31 through 35 of Mark chapter 3. If you have your Bibles open, read with me. It says, And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? His nuclear family is going, see, he's crazy. He doesn't even recognize us. Verse 34, and looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Two different families in this passage. The nuclear family, Jesus' mother and siblings, and the new family, including all of those who have abandoned their old lives to begin following Jesus as their Lord and as their Savior. So here's how this morning is going to go. I want to talk about Jesus' nuclear family. It's in the text. It's an important detail in the Lord's life, and it, and it sheds some light on specifically the mother of Jesus. I think as evangelicals, when we hear the name Mary, Mother Mary, or the Virgin Mary, uh, it feels a little bit puzzling why we don't emphasize Mary in the same way that maybe our Roman Catholic friends do. And so I want to understand from the text, not just this text, but biblically and maybe even historically, 
why we view Mary the way we view her and, and why Roman Catholics view her the way they view her, uh, because it's quite divergent from one another. And, and then I want to just talk briefly about the, the new family, and, and I want to end this morning by just giving you hopefully what will be very uh, <clears throat> comforting words, a, a bit of pastoral thought on some challenges with regard to the nuclear family, particularly in our context. One of the most frequently asked questions I get concerning the nuclear family and, and how I deal with it personally and how perhaps you can deal with it as well. But let's start with Jesus' nuclear family. What do we know about his nuclear family? Uh, we'll start with Mary, because I think that is really the, the person we're going to be focusing on more than anyone else. We get the first account of Mary, the mother of Jesus, with a conversation between her and an angel named Gabriel in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38, concerning how she's going to bear a son, and this son is going to be a very special son. Gabriel says to Mary, this is Luke 1, 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called a holy, the Son of God. Now, if this were not already unbelievable news, as it were, to make matters infinitely more complicated, Mary was a virgin, betrothed to a man named Joseph. You can imagine how he handled this news. Not well, right? He, he uh, is not buying it. Matthew's gospel, an angel visits Joseph as well doesn't say which angel, probably Gabriel. I mean, I think that makes sense, but it doesn't spe specify. It could have been another one. Uh, at this point, he has received the news from Mary concerning her pregnancy. He obviously does not believe her story because Matthew 1.19 says he resolved to divorce her quietly. So the angel visits him to tell him that Mary is in fact not lying and that the birth of this child is going to be extremely important for the rest of the world. In fact, the birth of this son is going to bring fulfillment to Isaiah 7.14 which is the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and she will name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Somehow, Joseph isn't aware of it, but somehow this baby is going to bring fulfillment to that. And so Joseph uh, takes the word of the angel. He stays with Mary. They get married. Mary gives birth. They name him Jesus, just like the angel commands them to do. Beyond this, there's not much more mentioned about Mary. There are a few passages, Luke 2, 41 through 51. It's a story about Jesus as a young boy who's left behind at the temple when his family starts to go back home. It's, it's really kind of like one of my favorite stories. You know, the whole idea of like it takes a village to raise a child. Apparently they lived by this, right? Because they're on their way back from the village and they're like, hey, you got Jesus, right? No, you? Who, who has Jesus? No one has Jesus. We've left Jesus, right? They go back and he's there in the temple and he's like, I got to be in my father's house, you know, uh, which is very confusing for them pans out in the end. It makes sense. She's mentioned here uh, in Mark 3, although not by name. It just says Jesus' mother. Uh, John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. She's at the wedding in Cana when Jesus performs the first miracle. Remember when he turns the water into Welch's grape juice. Um, it's a very important miracle for that wedding. They loved their non-alcoholic grape juice. Um, John 19, 25, she's present at the crucifixion. She sees her son die. She's there with uh, Mary Magdalene and some other women as well. The last time she's mentioned is in Acts 1.14, when the Holy Spirit arrives and falls on the first disciples uh, right during Pentecost, which is really an astounding detail. I, I just as a side note, uh, the fact that Mary is present there to receive the Spirit is extremely um, interesting if you've read Luke 1 in depth. Here's what I mean by that. In Luke 1, you get the accounts of John the Baptist and Jesus and their conception and births. And if you trace the characters throughout chapter 1 of Luke's gospel, here's what you discover. John the Baptist receives the Holy Spirit while he's still in Elizabeth's womb. When Elizabeth visits with Mary, John the Baptist in utero recognizes Jesus, who is also in the womb, and leaps for joy at the presence of the Lord Elizabeth catches the Holy Spirit during this moment. She is now full of the Holy Spirit. Later in the chapter, Zechariah, who's been silent during this time because of the angel and everything that happens there, he, they name their son John. It says he receives the Holy Spirit. So everyone in Luke 1 receives the Holy Spirit except Mary. She doesn't receive it until Acts 1 
with the rest of the disciples, which I just think is a, an interesting detail uh, when you're reading that account. After Acts 1, she vanishes from the narrative. She's never mentioned again. She's not mentioned a ton in the first three centuries. So uh, you get Ignatius of Antioch, mentions her in his defense of the humanity of Jesus. Um, you get a, a mention of her in Justin Martyr. Uh, he writes about the virgin birth as well. Uh, Irenaeus of Lyon talks about the humanity of Jesus is accomplished through the womb of Mary. Uh, Tertullian sort of echoes the same sentiment. The first, we're going to do some history. I, I should have warned you up front. We're going to do some history. Uh, the first substantial mention of Mary comes in the 5th century at the Council of Ephesus where they give her the title <clears throat> Theotokos. It's a Greek term, roughly translates as God-bearer. So this is the term uh, that is applied to Mary as the mother of God. It's a significant theological term. It's, it's an orthodox term. We agree if Jesus is fully human but also fully God and Mary is Jesus' mother, it could be said that Mary is the mother of God. It doesn't mean that God begins with Mary or, or that she somehow creates God, but she is the womb through which God takes on human flesh in his incarnation in the person of Jesus Christ. So she is in some sense the mother of God. But even during this time, efforts are made to make sure that Mary isn't elevated above her uh, the, the appropriate status. So for example, uh, Epiphanius says, let Mary be held in honor. Let the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost be adored but let no one adore Mary. So, yeah, we should honor Mary. We don't worship her like we do God. Ambrose of Milan, I love this quote. He says, Mary is the temple of God and not the God of the temple. That's a really, really good way of framing that. Uh, so it's a bit shocking then when we read some of this to find out that within the Roman Catholic tradition, Mary is a, how do I say this? kind of a big deal. She's the queen mother. She intercedes to Jesus on our behalf. She's venerated over all the saints. She's the primary figure of the rosary. When you pray the rosary, Mary is central to that. Uh, Roman Catholic doctrine teaches that Mary was sinless from start to end. That's a, that's a divergent view from us. We believe that only Jesus was sinless. Mary is sinless. She's sometimes referred to as the co-redemptrix alongside Jesus, meaning that the act of bringing redemption to humanity is not a work of Christ alone. This is why the Reformation brings solus Christus into play. By Christ alone, in Christ alone, is redemption found. Beyond that, uh, you get things like the Immaculate Conception. That's what actually refers to the sinlessness of Mary. That She wasn't just a virgin when she conceived, she was sinless in her conception. Um, I'm going to mention this one because this is relevant to our text the teaching of the perpetual virginity of Mary, meaning that Mary remains a virgin for the entirety of her life. This is a, a, an official dogma of the Catholic Church. And I will say that history is full of many people who endorse this idea. It's a relatively new official doctrine. It doesn't become a dogma until 1854, believe it or not. Uh, Pius IX is the one who brings this into order. But there are a lot of people throughout history who held to the perpetual virginity of Mary, including, and this one shocked me, including Martin Luther and John Calvin. So much for the Reformation, I guess. But, I, but, but in all seriousness, this illustrates something important about the Reformation, that while they were willing to reform some unbiblical doctrine, they didn't reform all unbiblical doctrine. One of the battle cries of the Reformation, the Latin phrase, semper reformanda secundum verbi dei. It's a, a, a phrase that means always to be reformed according to the word of God. Always reforming. The Reformation didn't happen and end and now it's over. The Reformation continues. We continue to be reformed according to what? The word of God. The Bible. Now, you might be able to figure out from this text in Mark 3 why the doctrine of the perpetual virginity of Mary might be problematic. Who shows up at the house of Simon and Andrew looking for Jesus? Verse 32, they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside. Brothers here in the Greek, Adelphoi, the plural of Adelphos, which is the word that does mean brother, it can, in its plural form, 
also means something like brothers and sisters. So you get this in a lot of languages. If you, for example, the, the Spanish word abuelos, plural, uh, abuelo, grandfather, but in its plural form can just mean grandparents, both, both granddad and grandma, right? Same here. Later in Mark 6, 3, there are people in the synagogue that say of Jesus, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and are not his sisters here with us? Jesus had brothers and sisters. Now, unless your parents prevented you from going to that awkward science class in the fourth grade that one time, you know why Jesus having brothers and sisters presents a problem for the perpetual virginity of Mary. Even Matthew's account of the birth is telling. Matthew 1.25, Jesus did not know her until she had given birth to a son. So hear me when I say this, because I think we get Mary wrong sometimes in the evangelical faith as well. Mary is very important. We should hold Mary in high esteem. We should, uh, we should honor and respect Mary. Mary is Jesus' mama, and he loves his mom very much. Even Mary herself said in Luke 148, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Amen. Mary is blessed. She is the mother of God. She is not God the mother. She does not intercede for you when you pray. Her son does that. That's her son's job and the Holy Spirit's job. She did not remain a virgin. She was married. She had a husband. They had other kids. Those kids eventually become pretty important, some of them, to the New Testament, particularly James, right? Although during Jesus' earthly ministry, they did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. In John 7, for example, when Jesus goes to the Feast of the Tabernacles, this is where he does the living water uh, demonstration, it says in verse 25, for not even his brothers believed in him. Now, eventually, James does believe. He writes the letter of James in the Bible. Uh, Acts 15 indicates he's the leader of the New Testament church, but he's not a believer at this point in Mark 3. He just thinks, big brother's gone mad, and I'm here with my mom to pick him up because he's kind of ruining our reputation as a family. And that's why Jesus says in verse 33 through 35, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those around him, he said, here they are, those who do the will of God. There my brothers and sisters. There's that reference to sister and mother. The nuclear family is very important. It's not nearly as important as the family of faith. The new family is comprised of people who are interested in doing the will of God, submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, how do you come into this family? We know how we come into the nuclear family. How do you come into the family of faith? By faith. John 1.12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to them that believe on his name. The family of faith is created through faith in Jesus Christ. Every time a person believes the gospel and is born again in Jesus Christ and receives the Holy Spirit, they become a part of this new family of faith. They join the family of God. And hear me when I say this. They are the priority above all things. I read Matthew 10, 34, and 35 a moment ago. I'm going to read it again, this time through verse 37. And I just want you to hear the words of Jesus because I don't think it gets any clearer than this. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I think that's pretty clear where the priority lies. It lies with Jesus. Now, that is not to say that the nuclear family doesn't matter. I want to be very clear about that. One of the Ten Commandments, the Fifth Commandment to be exact, Exodus 20 verse 12, says, Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord God is giving you. You're to honor your father and mother. That is a biblical command. It's one of the top ten. Uh, beyond that, you get text in the New Testament. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. 
First two quotes, Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Both of these texts demand honoring your parents. The word honor, by the way, it means to estimate with respect of worth to treat with high regard. So this is clear biblical teaching. Honor your parents. So I want to end our time this morning addressing one of the more frequently asked questions I get concerning this idea of honoring your parents, particularly in the context of City on a Hill. And what I mean by that is this. Oftentimes, people who come to our church are looking desperately for the help, hope, and healing of Jesus. And generally, that means that to some extent, their relationship with their nuclear family is broken. And so they struggle with this. Some of you have great families. Some of you have generational great families. And I, and I, I look at you in awe because it's so rare and it's beautiful and it's, it's God's design, as we're going to see here in a moment. But many of you, like me, you have a complicated relationship with your family, a long and painful history with your family. And you struggle with this. How do I live obediently to the scriptures to honor my father and mother and not get trampled on by those same people who are not only not Christians, but may be unsafe to be around? How do I do that? So I want to try to answer that question this morning for us. How do I honor my father and mother, especially if they're unsafe to be around? I'm going to just transparently start by saying this is a question that I have wrestled with personally through the years. Uh, my dad is in prison, uh, will be for the rest of his life. To my knowledge, I don't have any contact with him. He's not a Christian. He's not a safe person. So how do I honor him? For starters, I want to, I want to build this theologically from the ground up for you. For starters, let me begin with the truth. There is no other relationship more important to the development of a healthy society than that of the parent-child relationship. So biblically speaking, let me say this, the husband and wife relationship is the priority. It's the top. Husbands and wives are to see one another as the chief, most important person in their earthly relationships, okay? But the parent-child relationship is more fundamental to the development of a healthy society. Why? Because it is the biblical design for the parent to train their children in godliness, to instruct them in the word, and to lead them to Jesus. Ultimately, it's God that saves, so it's not up to you for your children to get saved. God saves, the spirit leads them to salvation, but ultimately, we know through history and experience, God works through people, and he intends to work primarily or first and foremost through the parent. And all throughout, especially the Old Testament, we get commands that make this very clear, that they are to teach, train, admonish, instruct, discipline, edify in the law of God. That's their role. Already, I read Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, um, you also have texts like the Shema, which is like fundamental to Old Testament theology. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7, hear, O Israel, Yahweh, our God, Yahweh is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Jesus, by the way, quotes this in Mark chapter 12, verse 30. We'll get to that in the year 2031. He talks about the great commandment. But verses 6 and 7 continue. He says, and, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. In other words, everywhere you go, everything you're doing in every context, you're to be viewing the instruction of your children with a biblical framework. Parents are the chief disciple makers of their kids, not the church, not the children's ministry, not Awanas. Those are all helpful tools that aid the parent in this endeavor, but it's the parent's responsibility. The parent is held responsible by God above everyone else. That is why I say that the parent-child relationship is the most fundamental relationship to the development of a healthy society. If parents are doing this, society is generally a better place. Why? Because generation after generation after generation after generation are faithfully walking in obedience to God's commandments, and that is a good thing for everyone. 
you are seeing in real time right now what happens to a society that moves away from this. Look no further than postmodern America to see where this leads when you abandon this. Society is better this way. Now, with that in mind, this is why I bring all this up. That is the context to which the fifth commandment belongs. The fifth commandment assumes that the father and mother have done their job. It assumes mom and dad are faithful believers in the Lord God and have done everything to train their children to follow him. And now, in their older age, they are to be honored by their children who are also faithful believers raising their own children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. That is the context of this commandment, and it's an important one. The fifth commandment does not have in mind a mom or dad who doesn't give a rip about honoring God or walking in obedience to the commandments of Scripture. I have heard Exodus 20.12 weaponized against Christian people who struggle to love and honor their parents because their parents are unsafe. And so people will say things like, people have said this to me and my own family. You know, you call yourself a Christian and you don't even honor your parents. What they mean by that is, I'm not willing to take boundaries down and just let them do whatever they want. That's not honoring. That's not the right context that the fifth commandment belongs. Now with that said though, let's be fair. If Exodus 20.12 and Ephesians 6, 1 through 4 don't qualify obedience either. So what that means is it doesn't say Honor your father and mother, unless they're horrible people, and then you get a free pass. So what does it look like to honor your father and mother if they are not safe, if they are immoral and or not Christian people? How do I do this? I ask myself this question regularly. I begin by asking this question, how do I honor my heavenly father in my life? How do I honor my heavenly father? Because if what I'm doing is honorable to the Heavenly Father, it's good enough for any earthly father as well. So how do I honor my Heavenly Father? I honor Him by obeying Him. By standing on and living for and speaking the truth in love no matter what it costs me. I honor Him by living out my calling and using the gifting that He's given me to accomplish the mission that He has put before me. These are the things for me and for you who are Christians, that we do to bring honor to our Heavenly Father. When I do these things, I honor my Heavenly Father and my earthly father as well. The the biblical desire of a parent, according to many of these texts, is that our children would grow into God-fearing Christian men and women who desire to live out their calling in obedience to Christ and His commandments. My father personally again, to my knowledge, does not have that desire. But understand this. Whether he has that desire or not has no bearing on whether or not he's honored when I do those things. Just because he doesn't have the desire for me to do them doesn't mean that when I do them, they don't honor him. Those things are honoring regardless. Why? Because they're the right things. Because they're what God calls us to. This is God's design for humanity. It's what he should want. It's what every person should want. Whether we want it or not doesn't negate whether it is honoring. So um, let me give you another example to kind of think through this. My kids are in school, and and they go to Sunday schools on Sunday for all three (laughs) services. When my kids do the right thing at school or in church, when they make the difficult but right choices, when they choose mercy over revenge, when they've been wronged. (laughs) Those things honor me as their father. I hear about those things and it blesses me. Man, my kids, really, they did that? Because they don't do that at home, that's crazy. (laughs) I'm kidding, they do, They're, they're good kids. But here's the deal, even when they do those things and I don't hear about them, I'm honored. They're honoring me. It has nothing to do with what I think or whether or not I'm even aware of it. It's honoring to me because it's the right thing, because they're choosing the right thing. If I die today and they live the rest of their life serving Jesus Christ, they will be honoring me. I won't even be here. Amen. Honoring your father and mother is not doing, hear this, whatever they want or ask you to do. 
That is not honoring. It's actually quite dishonoring if it enables them because it usually enables them into self-destructive behaviors and that is quite dishonoring. You know the difference between right and wrong. And so for you to do something just because they're asking is not an honoring thing. Honoring does not mean removing boundaries. It does not mean not protecting yourself from potential harm. It does not mean not speaking the truth in love even though it might cost you a, a fun Thanksgiving or Christmas gathering. Boundaries are good if they're built on the truth and they're honoring. Some of you need to hear this. Holding safe boundaries towards your nuclear family may be the most honoring thing you can do. It might be the most honoring thing you can do. The nuclear family is messy. It's messy. And praise God when, when he redeems families and when he begins generational blessing. It's something that, that we pray for. It's something that we hope for, not only for our family, but for the families here in this church. But praise God that he also gives us a new family when our nuclear family never gets there. If you're struggling with this, if this is something that, that you're like, man, you are reading my mail this morning. First of all, it's not me reading your mail. But if this is something you struggle with, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you this morning, as we pray here in a moment, to pray about there are cards on the, the seats for freedom groups. There is one particular group we're offering starting on January 31st. It's a Wednesday night called Breaking the Cycle of Hurtful Family Relationships. And if the Holy Spirit is sort of poking at you right now, going, huh? That's weird. That feels, you need to pay attention to that. Then, might I ask you to prayerfully consider signing up for this group and, and begin working in a safe place with a safe process to bring healing to your heart and to see and grow in boundaries and in a healthy way of thinking about things that are otherwise unhealthy and you're maybe not even aware of. Because here's the deal. My experience has been, and I've seen it in so many of you as well, that when you do begin working through this, it actually enables you to really love people that you struggle to love in a way that is very honoring to them, very genuine. And so I'd ask you to consider that in prayer this morning, taking that first step and beginning that process to work through that. Pray with me. Father, thank you for a difficult text, a difficult topic, but oh, an important one. The family is, is so close to your heart. And yet, in this fallen world, families often don't look the way they should, operate the way they should. And, and so, God, we rejoice that, that even in the vacuum of family, that when we don't have a healthy family, you provide for us a new one of people who love you, of people who are committed to doing your will, submitting ourselves to you as Lord, what great fulfillment we find in that and, and how we long for and look forward to that day when in eternity, in the resurrection, there's no more hurting, there's no more tears. But until then, God, would you give us the, the healing that we so desire by your spirit to our hearts and the ability to love the most seemingly unlovable people in our lives just as you loved us. We honor you. We worship you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.